guys, back with another portable Clint. My next guest and friend I've known for a long time. He is a soldier in Hollywood, dude. He is always on the front lines. He is always going, going, going. I don't think he's ever had a year off that he hasn't booked since he started. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike McGill. From the front lines. Front lines. To portable Clint. To portable Clint. 21 years. Yes. How long it took. I know it. Pay your dues. Pay your dues. Oh, buddy, yeah, good a, to see you, man. You too, buddy. Look, clean shaven and everything. You know, sometimes you gotta, although apparently I wasn't dressed up enough for my wife, but, uh, <laughs> but she does like the clean shaven. Yeah, my, my wife's not a Whiskers fan. She really? Doesn't like, she does not like the stubble. So even if you don't have an audition, you're shaven? Well, let's not let's not go too. Okay. Early. If okay. I don't have an audition, there might be a, a day or two where the razor doesn't touch the skin. Right, but, right, right, right. Mike. But for Clint, for the portable Clint, we want to we want to be you, presentable. Buddy. Thank you, buddy. You got here. Okay. My first credit that I see on your IMDb is 2001. Is that when you got out here? I got out here. Uh, I came out here for a week. Uh, I had some friends living out here from college, and it was spring break. It was actually the week of the Oscars. I remember flying out. Um, and we, How old were you? Uh, oh, God, 24 maybe? 23, okay. 24. So I came out for a week and got a lay of the land, went to Samuel French, bought all the books on you sure, know, how to sure. be an actor in Hollywood. Which one? The one, in the one in Studio City or no, the one in Hollywood? Oh, no, the one in Hollywood, okay. absolutely. The appropriate one. The appropriate one. Right. And then uh, took all those back, <laughs> started studying up. And then the following year, I moved out here. So actually, I drove out here in in conjunction with my cousin was getting married out in, uh, in Albuquerque. So I timed my move so I could go to her wedding and then and then keep driving out. And my first full day in Hollywood was April first, April Fool's Day, fittingly, 1998. Fittingly, exactly, 1998. So I feel like yeah, it was a few years ago. It's 21 years ago. So. Okay, but Ridiculous. now wait. So when did you get the acting bug? When did you start thinking about moving out to Hollywood? Uh, well, I got the acting bug when I was four years old and my dad took me to my first ever movie at the drive-in. It was Star Wars. What you kids would know now as A New Hope, episode four. But uh, I think I was pretty much hooked from, from the get-go. So it's something I always knew I wanted to do. And, and uh, I went to school, I went to college for radio, TV, film, but... Um, but I always knew that I wanted to come out here and pursue acting, so. Mike, I never like to get personable. Yes. Pers is that personable or personable? Get, get personable. Okay, portable, You're personable. You're the most personable guy I know, Clint. Come okay, on now. Okay, thank you. I don't normally, like I said, talk about personal, personal stuff, but you, my friend, stand out to me because I always see you having fun and taking care of your boys. You ought to take care of, well, as, as you do with your, your lovely young ladies. Well, you know? thank you, but I, I say that because you told me that your father took you to see Star Wars. Was yeah. that, did you learn that from your father? Was he always taking you to, to yeah. things? Yeah, I definitely. I had a hands-on dad for sure. I mean, I feel bad when I hear people that, you know, were orphans or come from single-parent homes. And, you know, I just, I was always blessed and lucky enough to, to have, uh, you know, my dad in my life. Unfortunately, he... He passed away before I ever moved out here, so I never got a chance to, to meet his grandsons or to see me work in Hollywood. But uh, we know he's watching. From he above. is watching. He is yeah. totally watching. Okay. Anyway, my hat off to you, dude. You look like an. Awesome, you are an awesome father, dude. I, trying, I love. Man. I love what you do. Trying, trying. Okay. So four years old, Star Wars. Yep. It it hits you like you wait. Wait a second. I love this stuff. Yeah. And yeah. so from just, 4 to 23, what's going on between there? Yeah, you know, you're just growing up, being a kid. I'm, I grew up in, in, I'm from Appleton, Wisconsin. I grew up on a lake shore, uh, Lake Winnebago. And Wisconsin. Lots of swimming, lots of eating cheese. Sure. Lots of uh, rooting for the Green Bay Packers, which is carried do. over to this day. Yeah, yeah. I know we had a, a game a couple weeks sure. ago that uh, kind of went, yeah, went one way versus yeah, the other. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. hey, the season's still young. Plenty of time. Okay, you move out here. Yes. Here's what I love about you. You are a working actor, Mike McGill. No matter, I know oh, you God. and I've talked, you know, when it's not busy, we're like, Dude, why are we doing this? You have 150 IMDB credits. Yeah, I also have a lot of a lot of debt, too. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> because that's, I, that's, wish, I wish you yeah, would even out. I, but. <laughs> McGill, I get it, dude. I get it. Right? Okay, so you move out here. You get all your books. You I do move out studying. here, and the first job I get, the first survival job Well, no, hang Okay, oh, go ahead. Oh, you're going to get, get to that? I'm going to get to okay, that. Okay, great. Right. But when you get out here, yes. who's, telling you you're, who's telling you what you need to do? 
Uh, when I got out here, I worked for uh, a, a manager by the name of Catherine James, uh, my, my friend Eric, who I grew up with, who is now also my manager. Uh, we both worked for Catherine. She was she was kind of integral in bringing uh, Quentin Tarantino to the forefront back when he was getting started. And she, really? she represented a lot of, of writers and actors. She represented Mark Dacascos, who's a, a pretty famous actor. Sure. And um, we both worked for her in her, her uh, Studio City office for... When you say for, worked, what do you mean worked? Meaning she sent you out or you actually worked for her? We worked, I worked for her and she also sent me out. Yeah, what were you sure. doing for it? Like errands and stuff yeah, like errands, that? Yeah, errands, answering the phones, uh, getting submissions ready for her clients. Is Back that then they used to have, they used to have the couriers would yep. come and pick up the headshots and, and resumes at, you know, noonish. So you'd have to get, uh, you'd go through the breakdowns and she'd make her selections and we'd get the headshots, staple them together and put them in a, a manila envelope and get them ready to go to whichever casting office they had to go to. Okay, so what was your survival job? Was that your survival job? No, my survival, well, that was one of my survival jobs. My other survival job was working for the National Research Group, which was um, folded into Nielsen many years later. And at, at that point, uh, when you, whenever you go to the movies and they're handing out passes to go see sneak previews of other movies, that's the job we did. You know I, that that's where we met, right? I do know that's okay. where we met. And I'm Clint, sure. I'm just gonna tell you right now, Clint was already a superstar amongst the, the NRG employees when I got there. So, and, and really, you're still um, a superstar amongst my inner circle because Eric, my manager, who I, um, who I told you about, he, he knows you by name. You're, I'm a Clint Culp type, man. I'll, I'll go and I'll Please. say, you know, guess who I saw at the audition? And he already knows to say <laughs> Clint Culp. He knows you, man. I remember that, uh, that you were running those uh, those uh, direct TV ads with Peyton Manning yes, for a while yes, during, yes. during Sunday Ticket. And yes. I'd be like, there he is, man, Clint Culp, Clint Culp. So you you've permeated the consciousness well of, of and all my i'm world. doing is trying to catch up to you oh, please. And look at that i'll look never at, catch up okay this guy. so you he she's sending you out yeah. when do you get rolling how do you start booking boy i'll tell you what you know it's because it, wait you're from 98 so from 98 yeah. to 2001 you don't have anything on your no, imdb not at all so yeah. tell me what you do for those first few years you know what ends up happening is you you, you get humbled in this town very quickly really you, know, you <laughs> <laughs> you come out, I remember people, like when I came out for that first week and was kind of g gathering information, people said, well, you know, you got to give yourself a year to, to get acclimated. And you know, you're like 24, yeah. you're like, Pfft. Yeah. Dude, maybe you need a year. Okay? <laughs> After a year, I'm going to be in TV and movies, baby. Exactly. Cut exactly. to three years later, it's like Dirk Diggler and, and Boogie Nights. You know, like, who do I literally have to get down on my knees and take care of here to get something going here? But uh, luckily... I kept it, I kept working with you know with Catherine and I said you know we'll we'll hit you and, and there was a movie that Mark Dacascos was in it was originally titled uh, The Perfect Husband it was later renamed Instinct to Kill oh. <laughs> with him and and uh, Kadeem Hardison and I got cast as an undercover cop who was in a stakeout in a in a vehicle and ended up getting blown up now the night before I was going to go to shoot it was somewhere in like Northridge I think is where the shoot was so you know I'd been out here probably two and a half, three years, I'm like, finally, I'm gonna get in the union, I'm gonna get my SAG card and whatnot. Uh, I just finished doing a sketch comedy show at the Complex on Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood. And so the whole cast went out to Dimples, the old karaoke oh, yeah, bar yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in uh, Burbank, Burbank, which is now like the Whole Foods Market and a bunch of sure, apartment complexes. That's right. But so we went there and we partied and we sang, one of my castmates and I went up there, we did a karaoke song and right before the karaoke song ended, I blew, my knee gave out. I completely like hit the oh, deck. Oh, 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 and to add insult to injury, it was Millie Vanilli Girl. You know it's oh, true. Oh man! Now they give you a, they used to give you a cassette of the performance that you really? could keep. I, it's pro I probably still have it somewhere floating around, but you can hear it. It's like girl, you know it's true. Thud. Ooh ooh ooh! You fell down, and then the song's over. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay. So I, I knew right away something was wrong. My, my knee swole up to the size of a basketball. I got up the next morning and I'm supposed to be on set in Northridge. Oh my I, gosh. I literally, I'm like, I am not letting this, I'm not letting this you opportunity, can't, you, you can't, can't do it. I uncorked a broom handle from a broom in my apartment, hobbled my way to set. Luckily, all I had to do was kind of angle my leg into the car because it was, it was a scene in a, in, a, in a car, a stakeout scene. 
finished shooting the scene, and then I went to Providence St. Joe's in Burbank to the emergency room and got looked at. Look at you, True dude. True story. True professional. You know, That's why you have 150 credits. You gotta suffer for your art. Sometimes. Amen, brother. Absolutely. Okay, before we before we get going, yes. let me tell you something about IMDB. IMDB. There's a lot of people, and I've said this a couple of times on this before, there's a lot of people who have credits on IMDB, like Joe's Place, Frank's Garage, you know. I'm adding Portable Clint to mine well, thank as soon you. as I get home. Thank you. But I'm saying names that no one's ever heard of. Right, right. And they go, yeah, dude, I got 87 credits. Look at all my credits. Right. Dude, but your credits, you, I can, I've can, i heard of every single one of your credits. Every single one? Well, you know. 90%? 90%. <laughs> Good. So that's yeah. impressive, man. I mean, dude, that is hard to do. Yeah. Well, as, as you know, I'm sure, you know, being out here in the trenches, you when you first come out here, you want to wow the world with, oh, I can do all kinds of acting. I can. I, I want to show the world my range. I can do this all the way to that. And then you quickly realize that Hollywood's only going to cast you for this little window right here. Yeah. And you can fight it. Or you can roll with it. And a lot of people do fight it. Yeah. I, I think I probably did for the first few years as well. And then I realized, you know what? Al Pacino, Bob De Niro, they kind of play a lot of the same types of roles. I mean, you know, and for me, it's a cop. It's always going to be a blue collar type. And that's why you and I are always at auditions together. You know, we're playing the blue collar types. So it's going to be a cop. It's going to be a security guard. It's going to be a bartender. It's never going to be like the chief of surgery or the head of law firm. They've got guys out here for that, you know. And, and I'm sure at first I wanted to be like, well, I could, I could be a lawyer. But let's be honest, you know, 90% of the time we're going to get cast in a blue collar role. There might be something out there that's, you know, perfect for us or, or they think against the grain. But that's where we're going to get hired. And guess what? They yeah. pay well and they pay residuals. I got to work with Clint Eastwood being a cop. I got to work with uh, James Spader and William Shatner being a cop. So... It's, dude, you know? again, people on the outside may go, dude, all you do is play cop. Yeah. But us insiders, dude, I'll take it any day hey, of the week, I, any you know, day. We like to work. Yeah, I, I want to be on set. Dude, That's why we're out here. here. I mean, same there's a here. lot of BS we got to put up with yeah. on a daily basis. And all that, all that shit melts away when you're on set. Yeah. And you're doing what you love to do. You're in the zone. I mean, there's no, it's a rush. There's nothing like it. So it makes, it makes putting up with all that other stuff worth it. Right. And if it has to be, you know, if I have to wear a, a, a if I got to be in blue with a you know a walkie-talkie and, and a club and a, a belt full of stuff, so be it. Yeah. You know? Have you ever in those 21 years go, all right, no more cops? Have you said that before and then quickly roll? What, what am I talking about? I mean, honestly, at this point in my career, I would love to be able to get an audition for a cop who's a series of regular on a cop show yeah, yeah. versus you know a cop who does five lines on one episode. But when push comes to shove, I'll take the five lines on one episode over zero episodes. You know? Dude, any day. We've but I'm got, just saying, have we've you got done mortgage payments? We've got uh, mouths to feed. Yeah, yeah. And and it's what it's our vocation. It's what we like to do. You know? Okay. So going back from 98 to 2001, mm -hmm. what's going on there? You say you finally got your first gig. Did you start working gig? right after that? No, no. I mean. Uh, I had a, a good a good little clip right after you know like right after I finally got my card. Um, I booked a couple jobs. How much in, did it cost to buy your card? Oh God! Your SAG screen. I feel like cards. it was somewhere between fifteen hundred and two thousand, maybe fifteen sixteen hundred. I maybe. feel like no, I bought mine at seventeen hundred. Did and, you? And, uh, okay. Yeah, in eighty eight. All right, then maybe so. I'm wrong. Maybe it was, maybe it was more like eighteen nineteen. Yeah, I think maybe it was, maybe like it was like closer that. to two grand. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It was under two grand, I think. Okay. I don't know. Uh, my my memory is getting fuzzy, <laughs> and my math math was never my strong suit. That's why we became actors. Man, That's right, right man. And Amen, we're not engineers. Brother. Amen, brother. Um, but I my my first kind of official TV show that I booked, I had worked a couple things here and there. I did uh, I did background work on Pearl Harbor. That was kind of eye opening, seeing a production that big and and seeing the craft service table that Brockheimer Productions came up with. I was like. What? Like made-to-order pasta bar omelets? Uh, oh my goodness! Uh, you know? But uh, but that was cool. But the first the first kind of big TV show I booked was Touched by an Angel. I got cast as Babe Ruth in a flashback. Uh, were episode. you a Babe Ruth fan? Even though you're from Wisconsin, were you still yeah, a Yankees yeah, fan? Was a, yeah, I was a Babe Ruth. Yeah, actually, I did like the Yankees because uh, Ricky Henderson was my favorite baseball player. Okay. He, he yeah. played for the Yankees at, at you know when we were growing up after he played for the A's, but. Um, so I did like the I did like the Yankees, but uh, yeah, I did like Babe Ruth, and I looked the type, and, and um, 
but I didn't know what he sounded like. So when I went into the audition, I just kind of did my dad, you know, hey, put her in there, kid. <laughs> and then, you know, once you booked the job, they gave me a DVD to study him. And he was, um, he was, he was kind of a marble mouth. He kind of was like an Edward G. Robinson. And he had kind of, a, you know, like a jutted. So of course, this being my first job, I was like really wanted to do good and, and do right by him. Well, he also bad left-handed, and I'm a righty, so I look like a spaz. I think they ended up having to flip the, flip the negative to make me look and, and you know, <laughs> edit it. So, and then they, and then I was, I told everybody, oh man, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna be on TV, and I'm gonna be on Touched by an Angel. They dubbed my voiceover. They dubbed my voiceover not only on that, but they dubbed my voiceover on that Instinct to Kill. So, like the first two things they did, they dubbed my voiceover, didn't tell me about it ahead of time, and I was like. Uh oh, what's going on? But, what did that do for your psyche? I mean, obviously yeah. you just said it, but it, does well, it mess guy, with you? I mean, the guy they replaced me with sounded like he was 15, 16 years old. I don't know. I just, I mean, I think they paid me. So I, my psyche probably wasn't that damaged. I was yeah, just, yeah, like, you yeah. know, but it, it being your first yeah. gig and you're telling everybody back home, watch it. And they're like, that wasn't you. But, you know, welcome to Hollywood, kid. Welcome to Hollywood, yeah. kid. And and people love to find any way to put you down. Like, oh, hey, I saw right? you on Touched by the Angel. And like, oh, yeah. Oh, well, what's up with your voice? Right, right. And they're not congratulating you. They yeah. want to point out what's different about it. You, as, as you well know, at this point, if you got thin skin in this business, you're, you're yeah. out of there, man. You know, I mean, let's talk about that just for a second. I mean, yeah. do you get that a lot? Like, I, I re like when I was doing lots of commercials, they're like, hey, I saw you on a commercial last night. But dude, you're not saying anything. So what's up with that? You know, I think, like, I, like, I, it's I think it's always like that. I think the first few years, especially, you know, if like my my friends' parents and some of my relatives. Oddly enough, my parents were always very you know, supportive, which was good. But you know, they'd say like, "Well, how much longer are you gonna give it out there?" You know, yeah, well. And that kills us, right? I mean, does that kill you? Dude, I've been that? out here for six months. I haven't even gotten an audition yet. You gotta let me get my foot in the door. You know, they could say that now, and I'd be like, "Well, oh, yeah," but now I'm too old and stubborn to start <laughs> doing anything else. You know, I just don't want to start from scratch doing anything else. But um, yeah, I mean, you, like I said, you realize and you go, and, and it's tough because what you're what you're basically putting out there is you. you know? Yeah. And so, it's a lot of rejection. A lot. A lot of rejection, and and a lot of times, you know, you go to an audition like, Jesus, man, I killed that thing. This thing's like I looked at the at the breakdown, it's it fits me to a T, and they go in a completely different direction. It's no fault of your own. And now these days, it's like how many social media followers do you have? Does it is it ever about like giving a good read anymore? I have no idea. I just I'm too stubborn to to uh, to quit, and I don't have the energy to be tweeting and, and Instagramming eight hours a day. So I'm just gonna keep. Like you said, being on the being on the front lines in the trenches with all these other great actors yeah. that you've uh, interviewed here, all my friends who I, I, it's always fascinating to watch everybody's circus because we're all in it together. We really are, and, man. and you know everybody's got a little bit different different way, but you know I see Heights, I see PJ, all my buddies, you know, and it's great. I mean, you, you become friends with guys in the cast room, and it kind of stinks in a way because we're all usually going out for the same part. Yeah, yeah. So I, I feel like, well, I hope I get it. If I don't get it, I hope Clint get, gets it. And if Clint doesn't get it, I hope PJ gets it. And if he doesn't get it, then Chris Darg is probably going to get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mike, let me ask you something. Yeah. You were you started working, right? Yeah. When did you go? I don't want to get too head of the boat, sure. okay? But when did you book Speechless? I'm not speechless. Shameless. shameless. Do people say that a lot? I saw you on Speechless last No, night? no, they don't. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. I, I, I speechless the short still, lived, is still is short lived is two years. Still on? I have no yeah. idea. I would have I would have worked on it. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Dude, I would have done yeah, it in a heartbeat, man. Um, well, I had a really nice run. I was out here about 10 years, and um, I got on a hot streak. I was working. I, I did a couple episodes of The Office when it was really at the peak of its popularity. I did a nice... Top of show guest star on NCIS. I worked on Boston Legal. The one and only time I ever tested for a pilot was the middle. And it was the year before it got picked up the series. It was a pilot, and Ricky Lake was cast in the Patricia Heaton role. And, I and Lex Medlin. Lex Medlin got the job. Yeah, that's right. He got the job that year. But I tested. I tested that year. That's the only time I've ever tested for a series regular on a pilot. And and then right after that, the writer's strike hit, and it was like 10 years worth of, of paying my dues. And I was like, here we go. We got some heat in my career. Right back down to zero, starting from scratch. 
How many times have how many false starts have you had in this business? That, I, I would say that was that was probably my my most uh, acute false start where I thought like okay here we go finally and it was just like okay you're uh, we got a job for you it's scale plus ten take it or leave it you know I'd worked up a day rate to that point and it was day like, rates were really big back then scale plus ten take it or leave it and we know if you don't take it there's not twenty guys <laughs> behind me well there's a hundred guys yeah, behind me who will. at least yeah so uh, shameless was originally. You know, they said it was going to be a recurring co-star, and I, I'm sure you've you've had this in the business before. They they dangle that recurring yes, carrot in yes, front of you, yes. and you think, "Oh my gosh, it's going to be great!" And, and I've, it, it happened to me a couple times before, where you know, "Oh, this is great! It's going to be a recurring carrot." You do your one episode, and then that's it. Yeah, you, you, yeah. You're never heard that's, from again. That's that's the majority of right. my life. So uh, so with Shameless, I went in, and and um, John Levy's office is kind of a hard office to get into. He's kind of considered a tough nut to crack it within the casting community, but Luckily for me, being from the Midwest, John Wells' shows are always set in, in Chicago, in the Midwest. So I had done a handful of ERs. I did uh, a show for, for them called Citizen Baines with James Cromwell. And uh, I'm forgetting one. Oh, and I did Southland. Um, and so I'd went, I went. Southland was great. That was a great show. I don't know why that, man. I was mad that they canceled that. Um, so I'd gone in for Shameless, and it was a two-line role in the pilot or not the pilot the first episode after the pilot and uh i went in and did it and what was the part for Bob? it was the part for tommy the okay. part that i play on tom uh, on the show the part i play is tommy which is kind of nice because it's not a cop usually i'm wearing a ball cap and flannels and got scruff and he's, he's a bar fly uh in the show it's set in south side chicago and william h macy plays frank gallagher he's kind of a deadbeat dad of a bunch of kids and this bar that he hangs out called the Alibi Room is kind of like his cheers, you know. And so it's populated by regulars at the bar. And I auditioned to play one of the regulars named Tommy. There was a couple lines. And I did it, and I, you know, it felt good. And then a week later, they said they wanted to bring me back in for another audition for it. And I was wait, like, wait, 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 yeah. wait, wait. I've never heard this. Right? So you're telling me you shot an episode. No, I didn't shoot an episode. I just went in for the first audition. Okay. And then a week later, they wanted me to come back in and re-audition for the same thing. It was just two lines. And of course, you know, of course. I'm... Was there different people in the room? Yes. The first the first uh, audition was being put on tape and John Levy and the associates were in the room. Okay. The second audition, John Wells was going to be in the room. Okay. So, but I didn't know that first. They just said, you know, they want, they want you to come back in and read. I'm like, do I really have to come back yeah. and read for two lines? Really? You know, it's kind of, Sure. I I'm above it. that. I get it. And now I'm... I'm grateful that I, you know, ate a piece of humble pie and went back in there because yeah. now we're on season, two, we're, we're wrapping up season 10 and I've probably done like, I, I haven't even counted them all. I think like 78. 75, 80 episodes of the show. So it's been, it's been great. And I get a, you know, I get a front row seat to watch William H. Macy do his thing and he's fantastic. Is and, he? And, yeah, is he? yeah, he's great. He's great. You know, I mean, it's just. Why is he great? I mean, I know, you know why, what, but, but why? You, I mean, like when you work on shows, uh, it's easy to see why people are number one on the call sheet. You know, I did Boston Legal 10, 15 years ago, and James Spader, I mean, she should get the script, and he's got three pages solid of dialogue of like a closing argument. And, you know, I have my five lines I throw in <laughs> from the witness stand, exactly. from the peanut yeah, gallery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I remember he had just won an Emmy. And Henry Gibson, great actor, the Illinois Nazi from... Uh, from the Blues Brothers. Yes, uh, yes. He was the voice of Wilbur and Charles yes. Webb. I mean, he's a great, great character actor. And he, I, he's since passed away, unfortunately, but he was playing the judge. And, and, and James Spader's doing this doing this speech, and, and you know, he flubbed the line and he comes up to me. He's like, sorry, Henry, sorry, Mike. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me, dude? I, and that's how Macy is. When you get these scripts, he, you know, he's got these speeches where he's pontificating and he's going on, and they're two pages solid. And these guys, you know, Macy's, it's not a spring chicken. And he, maybe, you know, maybe there's a, a slight stumble on the first take. By take two, locked and loaded. Man. Word perfect? Yeah. And just, they just embody the character. You know, you just, and, and, and we know what, we know what he's going to say because we've seen the script, but it's still hard not to laugh because of the, because of the delivery, because the guy's timing is impeccable 
Does he does he have the script in his pocket? Is he looking at, at his You know what? Letter? Actually, on the Shameless set, technically, you know, usually when you go on sets, you get the little mini yeah, sides. Yeah, yeah, They don't do that on Shameless. So you either got to know your lines, or you, if you're like me, you, you, you print out the full page script of your scenes, yeah. fold them up, and stick them in your pocket. Sure, yeah. Uh, he, you know what, the, the script supervisor, Susie on the show is really great. She's always right there, but, but uh, they, you know, they might have to look at the script here and there. But I'm telling you, man, once these guys are in the zone, there's a reason There's a reason why these guys are number one on the call sheet. There really is. Is there anything that he's taught you as an actor? I mean, I just, he, he because he's, he directs too, he's directed in addition to a few episodes of Shameless, which a couple of which I was lucky enough to work on. He's also directed a few movies um, in between shows on hiatuses. And so he's always, he's, that brain's always clicking, not only as an actor, but he's always thinking of good, like items of business and, and things that were, you know, like it'll look better with the shot. It's just, it's great. And then, in, you know, in between takes, he brings his, um, he brings his ukulele to set and he'll sit there and strum. And I kind of let him dictate how much interaction he has with us because he usually has much more on his plate that he has to yeah. memorize and take care of than I do. So, but and some days he's some days he's kind of quiet and keeps to himself, and then some days he's regaling us with you know st stories of his career, which is I lap him up, man. I can't get enough. And I'm Good, sure I can, I, know it, I can speak for you know the rest of the cast as well. So. Did you have any idea you'd be doing 70, 80 episodes of this? Honestly, man, when anybody says. Uh, recurring. I thought if I could get f if I could get five seasons of a recurring character, I would be thrilled. So to get double that, and and I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure we're coming back for at least one more season. It's a gift. Man. It's a gift. How many false do you get? Like, hey, we're we're gonna need you next week, and, and then they don't need you. That's happened a handful of times. Not many. You know, maybe like four or five times. You Are know, you like, comfortable on that set because you're on there so much? You, yeah, you of course, because, you know, it's like a family. I mean, you know how it is. Sometimes you're, you're coming in for a guest hour, maybe even for, just for the day. And so, you know, my wife will say, like, oh, how was so-and-so? I'll be like, you know, hey, I didn't get a chance to talk to him. When you're on a week, I, I remember uh, probably the nicest star I've worked with is Mark Harmon. I worked on NCIS. Did you, have you worked on I him? did. I, I, I did. I, I feel like he rolled out the red carpet and just was the nicest most accommodating sometimes i don't get uh, much of a boo from some people he he was hanging with me in between takes in the director's chairs sitting at lunch with me telling me stories and i was a huge moonlighting fan and he came on and uh was the love triangle between bruce willis and sybil shepherd he was telling me moonlighting stories it's great well i heard a story about mark Harmon. i don't know if you told me this i don't know if this happened to you or not but he looks at people's imdb page the yeah, night absolutely, before he yeah, absolutely did he said oh i saw you were on uh Jag, what'd you, what'd you do on Jag? And I was like blown away. Couldn't believe Dude, that it. That is awesome. I mean, that, I mean, that's going above and beyond. Yeah, yeah, honestly. yeah. Honestly. Uh -huh. Okay, I dig that. Okay. Yeah. Mike. Yes, sir. Tell me this. Have you ever been on a set and you thought you were never to see the light of, like you you thought this was hell, I'm never going to get out of this moment? <laughs> no, I mean, there's some, there's some times where you'll be on a set and you can tell like, you're used to a fast pace on Shameless. They they got to move quick. They got to they got to get like 10, 11 pages of, of the script in the can every day. So they move at a pretty pretty fast clip. There's sometimes I'm, you'll get a director who we're, we're, we're just kind of like, oh man, what's going on? We're just it's moving like molasses around here, and you know it just kills it kills the momentum not just for you but for the crew and for everybody. You know you just you talk about false starts. It's just like no start. You know out of the gate. So. But rarely does it. Oh, well, but I guess my, my, I'm sorry. My question was, I should have said it better, but uh, a bad day, like you, you keep messing up, like you're in your head and like, all right, uh, let's you know, take it again. Yeah. Mike, yeah, do you need the script supervisor to come talk to you? Yeah, I yeah. mean, like that. That's happened a couple of times. I remember I remember the first ER I worked on and that's a show where the camera's always moving. Oh, dude, I always get you know, freaked two, out yeah, when right? I see that. And I was, uh, I was playing paramedic and um, it's like all in one take yeah, and everybody it's all has in one to be take and you don't want to be the guy yeah, who messes exactly. it up and of yeah, course yeah. that's exactly <laughs> what i was um and charles Hayde was the director sergeant ranko from hill street blues wow he was yep. the director yep. and i was still new enough where where i didn't know you know i i just froze up it was a, like mara tierney was in the scene makai pfeiffer was in the scene 
and it was like we were going to a body in the in the in the ambulance bay, and they all had their lines and what you know whatever my line was, which was you know he needs he scraped his knee or he blew this out. I just you know I just went up because I was just overwhelmed, and I just froze and, and I could hear Hayden like keep going, you know. <laughs> And then, of course, you freeze up even more. And he said, and then we, then we cut. And luckily, Mackay Pfeiffer, like, picked it up for me and kept the scene going. But he, he said some. Hade came up to me after. He was like, don't ever stop. Keep going. You never know. We might get something. Something, something that affected him. I was like, okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then the, the other time I remember was, uh, it was season, I think it was season four, season five of Shameless. And uh, my younger son, Johnny, was teething. And so the sleep deprivation was yeah. at an, at, at an all-time high. And it was, it must have been season five because Lip was working for me on that, on that job site. And so I had a bunch of, you know, lines of dialogue and I just kept, there was one scene I just couldn't, my brain would not lock in. I couldn't get the lines out. And, and strangely enough, it got cut from the episode. I wonder wow. why that happened. Wow. But I mean, I just, and I felt bad because normally that's not me and that's absolutely not the guy I want to be, especially when you're coming in and you, you don't have that much to, to mess up with to be to begin with yeah but but i just my brain was just fried from from sleep deprivation and so luckily uh luckully the teeth came in and, and uh we we got back on track but did yeah. you show up the next episode kind of bashful because you were a little into yourself no, i think i think it was just i i just remember that one day and i remember i i remember i caught the cameraman looking at each other you know oh, dude, when you, you know, catch the camera and they're looking oh, at you like dude. oh my but you know i there's, there was there was one time a few seasons ago in Shameless, there was a guest a guest actor cast, and uh, just could they could not they could not remember their lines to save their life. Was it somebody that we know? Like, it is it somebody you would know, but I, out of respect, yeah, of I, don't course, wanna, of course, I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to tip the hat. And I and I was excited when I heard she was coming on, but she had taken a so break. So it's a she. It's a she. Yes, she she had taken <laughs> a break from acting. I think she was just getting back into it. And I think she was supposed to do five or six episodes, and it just it just wasn't coming together for her. And you know, you feel bad for you feel bad for her, but but it was just holding up production. So she was one and done. She, no, they recast her, and so we had to come back. We had to come back a week later and, and uh, cast, reshoot scenes with a new actress, and then the new actress was having a hard time oh. getting through the scenes. And I was like, oh my god, this this is like the uncastable role. But uh, luckily, luckily things settled down and. and uh, they got into the groove and it, it worked itself out but yeah it, 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 it just makes for an uncomfortable time on set yeah yeah anybody. yeah but, mike yeah. if there was a secret that you had about how to book 150 imdb credits what, what what's the secret you know i think the secret is you just have to believe in yourself which is, it's is hard. easier said than done in this business because you are going to you're going to run into so many roadblocks and so many people that are going to say you can't do it, including you know people close to you, which is, is really frustrating. But uh, I, I remember when uh, when Eric used to call uh, casting offices to get feedback, and one you know one or a couple times I hate I, I don't want I feedback. Kinda, I, well, I I, I kind of eavesdropped in, and boy, oh, let me tell you, they do not pull any punches if you if if you are feeling self conscious about yourself before that. Wait till you hear some of these these comments. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> Like what? Like what? Give me something. You're, if you uh, remember. I remember once I, I was doing those uh, casting director workshops at Actor Site with uh, Jack Turnbull, and I, I, I had done one, and um, and Eric had called up for feedback, and the casting director was saying like, oh, you know, when he came in, he his hair was all greasy and his oily, his skin was oily looking, and he just he looked really bad. And then like as an afterthought. She at the end she said, "Oh, but but he surprisingly he did a pretty good job. He did, gave a good read." That's and I thought, "Wow, lady, wow, what did what did you really think?" <laughs> and at that you know at that point I was probably 26, 27, had a full head of dark hair, and probably was considering myself the the, the next Tom Hanks. Now, now I'm like Tom Hanks' dad. <laughs> Mike. Worst time in Hollywood. When did you think about quitting? I mean, not how many times, yeah. but when did you really, what's the closest you thought about quitting? You know, I, it hasn't really been thought about quitting. A few years ago, we were talking about, we were trying to get a house. You know, my, my wife and I, we've got two young sons and two dogs, and we were living in a two-bedroom apartment, and there was, you know, there were some 
deliberations about possibly moving to Las Vegas where her uh, immediate family lives. And I thought, ah, man, I, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do it. You know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to continue. I'm, I'm certainly not going to get on the 15 freeway at 6 a.m. and drive in here for a, a noon commercial audition at Ross Lacey and then get back and drive right yeah. back, you know. So we, that, you know, that was a little bit of a, of a time where I was like, uh, but at the same time, you need, you know, you want to provide for your family too. So, uh, luckily, you know, luckily we worked with um, a couple of folks and I've been able to keep a house in, in, uh, the general Los Angeles vicinity for two years, only 28 more to go before it's paid off. But Mike, can I tell you something? <laughs> I was proud of you, dude, when you got that house. Yeah, I remember you posting you. about that. I was like, dude, that's, that's, it's right? so hard. You want to have it's a, so you want to have a yard for him to run around yes, in and, man. And, you know, to just, Okay, really yeah, quick. Here's yeah. some quick questions. When the phone is not ringing for you in LA, what do you do? I mean, quite honestly, I, I am kind of a, 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 a Mr. Mom. You know, I'm trying to keep up with my boys. I have two young sons. They just turned nine and six. And so there's all their extracurricular activities. There's Cub Scouts, karate, Little League. No, I get that. I get that. But what else do you do if the phone's not ringing if the for, phone's, you I mean, yeah. for you to get some heat? For you to get some heat. I need to be a little bit better at it. I've, I've gotten a little complacent. You know, I, I want to definitely uh, do some writing and, 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 and have an eye towards directing. You know, I'd, I'd like to... I'm, I'm four, I just turned 46 this summer. I'd like, to, I'd like to get a movie written and directed by the time I'm 50. You know, so that's something to look forward to. I need to, but I need to, you know, hunker down and, and do the work on that. Um, if I could give you anything in Hollywood, what would you want me to give you? Uh, I would say a series regular job on a show that goes into syndication. That way, we've got uh, we've got a financial base that we can know that the house will be paid for and bills will be paid for, and then uh, maybe the family can go on a nice vacation every year. Amen. And uh, you know, in, in during the hiatuses, I can work on. I'm doing a, a movie here and there. What network would you want it on? I guess one of the major networks right, so I can get exactly, some, I can get some exactly. residuals, yeah, right? Yeah, you yeah. know, NBC, CBS, Fox. Okay, I'm not I just picky. didn't know if you if you were like, man, I want a cable show because you, because you can do more. But then again, if you want to do more, you get paid less. Well, I'd love to do the kinds of shows they do on cable with a 26 episode schedule on a network with yeah. reruns during right, the summer, right? right? That would, that's a, that's a perfect world. That's like a 1998 world, unfortunately. Mike, I'm gonna ask you one last couple. Of yeah. This is the end, dude. Oh man. This is the end. I mean, we're, we're at 37. Holy Can you cow! We're how pushing fast it. it goes? We're pushing it, brother. Best time in Hollywood. Um, that I, I would say that I mean, as far as heat wise, that that year leading up to the writer strike was was pretty pretty awesome because that's and when you, I that's when I was kind of getting my first taste of guest stars on a regular basis testing for the pilot working were, on great I'm shows sorry, did you test to be the dad in i did the test to be the dad yeah the, the role that lex ended up getting i did test to be that role mm -hmm. and but, but, aren't you, know. you kind of glad that you didn't get it because i think about lex yeah that i don't know great how actor. great actor i love lex i want him on the show i've reached out to him sure. and he will he will do it one day but Lex Medlin was up, he, he booked the part for the dad in the middle. Right. Then they go, no, we don't want him. Let's recast. Let's recast everything. Yeah. And then you have to sit back at your house for eight years and watch somebody else do what you thought you had. Yeah. I don't know tough. how I could deal with that. It, you know what? It's it's weird. Actually, uh, Lance Barber, I'm sure yes, you know Lance. Yes, yes, He He plays the dad on Young Sheldon. And he and I are the same type. We're both from the Midwest. You ever run into him on the DLB? I, I run line? into him all the time because we we uh, we share the sound stages that we're both on. There's a hallway with with dressing rooms in between, and we yeah, share that hallway. Right, so awesome, awesome. I see him almost every time I'm working, which is great. And uh, I remember you know bumping in, into him a few years back. We were going out for something, and he said, "Man, just give me just give me three years on a network sitcom, and you know I'll get my house and this and that." And, they're on season three of Young Sheldon right now. He's he's good to go, but that gives it, me dude. hope. Man, dude, you know? it gives us all yeah. hope, man. Or like, um, you know, I auditioned. I, I'm sure you probably did too when when they were casting Mike and Molly. Yes. You know, I auditioned to play Mike, and I thought, man, I got this thing in the bag. This one's mine. And and then you see Billy Gardell, and that guy's been knocking around for years. Yep. And it was his turn, and it was his time. I ended up doing one episode on Mike and Molly as a cop, and 
I can't be mad at the guy. You know, like if it, it would be one thing if the guy was a dick and a jerk and a yeah. man, how dare he take what job was mine? But you know what? He's he's a good blue collar guy too. He's got a family to provide for. It was his show and he did a great job with it. Mike, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Our category is one of the best categories in Hollywood because we literally care for each other. We, we're rooting for each other. For Even sure. though we hate it when you We know the struggle. Me, the struggle is struggle. real. The struggle is real. Yeah. And we're always so proud of our fellow Absolutely. gentlemen actors out there. Yeah. Or for any actor out there. For any actors. And actually that reminds me, I wanted to dedicate this uh, portable Clint to another a fellow actor friend of ours who recently passed away, uh, Brian Turk. Oh, a great dude. character actor, and uh, he unfortunately had a had a bum rush of luck with uh, some cancer. He passed away last month. But that one stayed with me for a while it's because a rough one. Yeah. I, not to go down. Let's give yeah. let's give that guy one minute. Yeah. Let's give that guy. He was a great character actor. For great sure. character actor. He was. He played at USC. He played yeah. at a Rose Bowl and yeah. won one. It's a big dude, man. But he something happened to him. Like he had cancer that he didn't deal with, right? He didn't I think so. I think you know he didn't realize it right away. Okay, God so bless him and that family, man. Yeah, for sure. All right, he's a good guy, dude. Absolutely. He was always he was one of us, always in the waiting room with Watched us. Watched my boys while I went into auditions yep. on multiple occasions. Yep. All right, that's a good one. Okay, uh, Mike. Yes, sir. Anything else I need to know about you? Uh, we're just uh, we're just fighting a good fight, man. We want to entertain people. We want to do what we love. Hopefully, one day you and I will be working Dude, together on have set. Have we ever worked together? At NRG. NRG. That doesn't count. We, we need to be, and on the and now on the portable Clint Dude, show. I know it. So that that's that's something. But we want to we want to snowball. Yes, yes, Keep it yes. Rolling. Mike. Thank you so much for doing this, man. Pleasure I really mine, appreciate man. you, dude. All right, do me one last favor. Make, oh, before we do that, make sure everybody watches uh, Portable Clint shows. There's all kinds of shows Clint's not got on there with fantastic actors. You'll learn a lot about the business. It's great. I well, love him. Watch this guy on Shameless. He's awesome. Season dude. 10 I mean, season, ten, season ten starts uh, November 10th. Look at you, man. On Showtime. And, oh. and everybody else, Audi 5000, Gene.